Hello and welcome to another video from the only channel that you need to not only survive the current apocalypse but actually enjoy it. And today's video is going to be about the concept of dualism. Dualism is the basis of every religion that exists on the earth. It is a determining of what is right and what is wrong. So it's, it's the belief that there are things that are pleasing to God and things that are not pleasing to God. It is about the difference between light and dark, between good and evil. And uh, recently in a conversation with a man locally about how you could tell the true religion from a uh, false religion or a religion that pleases God and a religion that does not please God, I said, well, every religion on earth is about the same experiences. So human beings around the world are going to witness a lot of the same things and they're going to write about them and they're going to leave these records where we could find them. And so the stories that seem to present the world around us according to the God of creation, will be different from the same stories as told by those perpetuating the teachings of the God of civilization. And the God of creation and the God of civilization are very, very obviously not the same God. As I always say in uh, my Bible-based videos, uh, the Bible is not a book about rules for how to get to heaven. It's a book about the war between creation and civilization. Always uh, spoken of in the Bible as the war between the righteous angels and the wicked angels, but also spoken of as the war between God's kingdom and Satan's empire. Now, a while back, a couple of weeks ago, I posted a video um, about how to determine the best English version of the Bible. And I said in that video that if you're going to compare Bibles to one another, you shouldn't compare verses that are very popular because those who translate the Bible know that if they stray too far from the original English interpretation that everybody's memorized, that people are not going to buy your Bibles. And one of the most popular scriptures in the entire Bible, a verse that everybody knows, even if they're not Christian, is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, which says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what I'm about to tell you is going to sound so alien that it, it may shock you. You may be disturbed by it, especially if this is the first time you've ever clicked on one of my videos. But I promise you that if you look this information up in your concordance and compare what I'm saying to what the Hebrew, Greek uh, dictionaries, encyclopedias, concordances, and lexicons say that I'm telling you the truth, the verse as it should be translated into English, would sound more like, in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. Now, even if you don't have access to a concordance, you can read just a few verses later on in the, the account of the creation of man, where it says, let us create man in our image. So obviously, and this is translated properly, that it, it really says, let us, plural, create man in our image. Now, the, the Trinitarians want you to believe that, that these verses are support for the Trinity doctrine. What I'm telling you is that the issue here is a whole lot bigger than some religious doctrine. The gods are spoken of throughout the Bible. Sometimes they're spoken of in the singular. The word, singular word for God is El. The plural word for God is Elohim. And both words are, are used over and over again throughout the Hebrew portion of the text that we call the Old Testament. Other words, which are nouns, also use this means of converting singular words to plural words. In English, if we say God, it's understood we're talking about one individual. If we say gods with an S after it, it's plural, more than one individual, and that's the way it is in the Hebrew language. El means God, Elohim means gods. And if you go back to Genesis 1.1, you'll see that in that verse are two other words. One is in the singular and one is in the plural. The first word is heavens. In the beginning, the gods created the heavens, Shemaim. Now, if you go to a concordance and look up the word Shemaim, it says, from an unused root. And in fact, it says a plural form of an unused root. So that, uh, that unused root would be Shem. So Shem is singular. Shemaim is plural. But in the Bible, you will not find the word Shem. At least that's the way I interpret that 
uh, information from the concordance. And in my search through the Bible, I was unable to locate the word Shem translated into the singular word heaven. But another word in that verse says, God created, the gods created, the heavens and the earth singular. And I think the word that's used there is eretz. Eretz is singular. If it was earths, plural, it would be eretzaim. And that's not the case. So if you do any kind of a of search on this and just kind of scan through the Bible, you'll see a lot of nouns that end in aim. If you look them up, they're plural, and you'll see a lot of nouns that do not end up in aim, and they're singular. So what I'm telling you is the truth. So we have to somehow make sense out of this. If we've spent our whole life worshiping a single God, we need to know if we still need to worship a single God or worship a whole pantheon of gods. Because throughout the Bible, the uh, Elohim are spoken of in ways that obviously indicates that they are righteous. But then the, the word Elohim is used in, uh, in acts to, that to us would be offensive or are very obviously evil. So what did Jesus say? You know, a lot of times if we, if we want to find out the truth about something, we go to the, the, the New Testament and listen to what Jesus said because Jesus' apostles we're always asking Jesus questions about the truth. And in fact, in one instance, Jesus is asked, how should we pray? A crowd of people said, tell us, Jesus, how should we pray? And he said, pray then this way. Our Father who art in heaven. That's at Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, I think. And uh, in that verse, he uses the singular word Father. He doesn't say... Pray then this way, our fathers who art in heaven. And another important thing that's brought out that I think is linguistically accurate is he doesn't say pray to your father or pray to my father. He said pray to our father. Our father indicating that his father, his God, is the same as our God. And so, and, and singular. He used the singular form of the word God. So, Irregardless of how many gods are involved in the Bible story, there is still only one almighty God. And so if we look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Even though that is linguistically inaccurate, it's still accurate. Because if God created everything, including the gods who created the earth, it could rightfully be said, that God created the earth, or in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, obviously, the Bible's been around for a long time, and I'm not the first guy to figure this out. Uh, so, you know, you, you may be wondering, how do the translators explain this when people ask them, why do you translate the word Elohim in the singular form? And uh, obviously, if we go back and we look at some of the early church stuff about these meetings of cardinals and bishops, a lot of Trinity stuff gets thrown in there. But the basic understanding that has presented today in most of the literature about why Elohim is translated as singular is based on something called the royal we. And rather than define that, I'm simply going to give you an example. Years ago, I saw some cartoon, I think it was an Alice in Wonderland cartoon, and there's this girl, Alice, and she says something to the queen, and the queen gets upset, and what comes out of her mouth is, we are not amused. Somehow, if you or I call ourselves we, it's an indication of mental illness. But if royalty calls themselves we, well, that's acceptable. And there really is scriptural backing for why that might be true. In the Bible, it very clearly says that the ruler of the world is Satan. When we look around, we don't see Satan. We see presidents, we see kings, emperors, prime ministers, those kind of people. And they're the ones making the decision. So if the Bible is true, and Satan is actually the ruler of the world, then these presidents, kings, prime ministers, etc., must be taking their orders from the spirit realm. In the Bible, that's called demon possession. So when a king or any other world ruler, you, if, if that's, even, that's even realistic, if these kings and other world rulers actually refer to themselves in the plural, 
It could be simply them acknowledging the fact that they are not simply a single individual, but they are a single individual possessed by a spirit, spirit individual, a demon. This actually is kind of talked about in the Bible as well. There is an instance in the Bible when Jesus comes across a man who's in a cemetery acting very violently. The man runs up to Jesus and starts talking to him. And Jesus asks the man, what's your name? And he says, well, my name is Legion because there are many of us. Another thing that the man says is, are you here to torment us before our time? Now, this word torment is used in a couple of places in the Bible. A person could be tormented with sickness. Uh, in Revelation, uh, some are tormented with fire and brimstone. Uh, some in the Bible are tormented with confinement. And so this, this concept of, of uh, demons being tormented is explained by Jude. Jude calls certain angels uh, the ones who are reserved for dent, uh, bonds of dense darkness or something of that nature. And for us to figure out why that's the case, why certain angels or gods or demons are reserved for torment, is also explained a little bit in the book of Jude. Jude says they are the angels that forsook their proper dwelling place. Now, if you look at that in the original languages, it's very, very obviously not talking about some kind of spiritual realm. It's talking about creatures that were supposed to be in one physical location where God intended them to be, but they left that location to come to the earth. These are the same angels that are spoken of back in the very earliest books of the Bible who came to the earth, saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and entered into the daughters of men in order to produce wicked offspring called Nephilim. The, the actual word is fellers. It's the same word that we would use for someone who cuts down trees for a living. And in the Bible, they're spoken of as the great heroes of the past, those mighty men of fame, uh, the men of renown. So once again, we're getting back to the rulers of the world, the kings, presidents, king, uh, prime ministers, and such. So... When Jesus was talking to this man, and the man responded to him, first thing Jesus has said, what is your name? And everything is singular. And then the man responds to him by saying, my name is Legion, singular. First person possessive, singular pronoun, you know, my, me, mine. My, singular, name is Legion. Because we are many. And if you look at that in the original Greek, it really is the, uh, the uh, plural version of I. So he, call, he refers to himself as I, singular, but then he refers to himself as we, plural. But the reason he's speaking of himself in the plural is because there were many demons. And the fact is, when Jesus uh, is asked about whether or not he's going to torment him, he says, please, please, send us into these swine and there was a herd of swine there so jesus sent those angels those those gods those fallen angels the demons into those swine and it wasn't one angel that went into the swine or one god it was the many it was legion and all of the swine jumped off of a cliff into the the lake and that was and that is the explanation for why a person can be spoken of in the plural or the singular and why there are multiple gods spoken of in the creation account. Now, even though the story of the Bible is about the war between the righteous angels and the wicked angels, and as indicated by the text, that includes quite a few individuals, there are actually two individuals who stand out as more important than the rest, and that would be Satan and Jesus at the very early earliest part of the Bible, Eve supposedly enters into an agreement with Satan to become a god. She is told by God, or through Adam, that if she eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, that she will die. But Satan comes along and says, no, you're not going to die. In fact, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, you'll become like a god, knowing good and bad. 
And so Eve had never been lied to before in the book of Revelation. Satan is not just called a liar. He's called the father of the institution of lying. So up until that point, Eve had never heard a lie before. So she had been told by two separate individuals, two completely different stories. One sounded better than the other. She went ahead and chose what was the best according to what she had been told. In the Bible, it's called a kidnapping. Now, a lot of the religions speak of Eve as if she committed the unforgivable sin, but the reality is she was tricked into this agreement because of inexperience. The, book, uh, the entire Bible brings this out over and over again. And when Jesus comes along, it said that he paid the ransom to the kidnapper. Now, I may not say that exactly word for word in our English Bibles, but the concept is there in the original Greek. It's there in the original Hebrew. The word ransom that is used in the Bible really means the same thing as our English word ransom. It is the price paid to a kidnapper. So these two individuals, Satan and Jesus, are the leaders of these two opposing camps of good and bad. We have now come to the part of the video that you really need to pay special attention to because we're going to talk about something that is spoken of in the Bible all the way from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. It permeates the entire Bible. And uh, if you've ever read the Bible for yourself, you may have noticed it, but the churches do so much to suppress this information that it's quite possible that as you're reading through the Bible, you completely missed out on the significance of these stories. There are so many stories about brothers in the Bible, sometimes in, in regard to twins, that uh, unless we really think about it, we'll miss a huge part of the story about this war between God's kingdom and Satan's empire. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, if you remember, there was an incident involving two brothers, James and John, the sons of thunder, Benarges, where the mother goes to Jesus and says, when you get into your kingdom, Lord, could you make my sons to sit down at your left hand and your right hand when you take your throne? And Jesus said something that's extremely important. He said, that authority belongs only to my father. So in the very near future, we're going to find out why that's important. But another set of brothers that are mentioned in the New Testament are Thomas and his brother. If you don't remember ever hearing about Thomas's brother, that's okay. He's never mentioned by name. But the name Thomas, Thomas, which is an actual ancient word, means a twin. A twin. Thomas. And that's important because all of his friends, the other apostles, called Thomas the Ademos, which is a definite article, twin. So Tom, us, a twin. The Ademos the twin, indefinite article and the uh, definite article. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. Now, I said earlier that every religion on earth is based on the same exact stories, and so Thomas and the apostles would have been very, very familiar with this story according to the Greek mythology at the time. Because remember, at the time, Judea was transitioning from being under the Greek authority to being under the Roman authority. So in, in that Greek culture, they would have been very familiar with Castor and Pollux. Many of you listening to this information have probably already figured out which brothers we're going to talk about first, Cain and Abel. In the account of Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel are said to be trying to gain entry by making sacrifices. Cain's sacrifice is rejected while Abel's is accepted later in the story. Cain kills Abel, and most of us already know all of that. However, a very, very important detail that the most of the churches leave out, or at the very least do not highlight enough, is the fact that Cain is the older of the two brothers. It's very likely that Cain felt slighted by the fact that his brother Abel gained entry before him, even though Abel was the younger. The next set of brothers we're going to talk about are two that you have probably never thought about in your life, and that is Noah and his brother. Most of us don't even know that Noah had a brother, but it is recorded in the genealogies that Noah had a brother, and once again, Noah's brother is older. Noah is asked to make an ark in order to preserve life, even though he is the younger of the two. When Noah enters the ark, he brings with him his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Once again, when the ark comes to rest on dry ground, it is not Ham that enters the garden, his firstborn, but it is Shem. When the Israelites entered the promised land, it was called the land of Canaan, and the Bible very clearly says that Shem would take Canaan with him when he entered into his inheritance. Once again, the younger makes entrance, the older does not. The next set of brothers we're going to talk about are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their brothers. Abraham is asked to enter into a strange land, which we find out later is the promised land, and he's asked to do this even though he is not the oldest. He has an older brother, and when he enters the promised land, he brings with him his nephew, just as Shem had done years earlier when he entered the promised land. His nephew's name is Lot. When Abraham has children, his firstborn is Ishmael, and his secondborn is Isaac. But once again, it is not Ishmael who gets the inheritance, but Isaac. When Isaac has children, they are named Esau and Jacob. Esau is the oldest, and through a little bit of trickery, Jacob gets to make entry or gets the inheritance rather than his brother Esau. And the details that are involved in this story actually give us more details about what has gone on in this war between God's kingdom and Satan's empire. Jacob's name means a serper. And that is a direct reference to the fact that he was the youngest, and yet he took the possession of the land away from his older brother. And most of us are familiar with that story. Later, we're given even more details as Jacob gets into a wrestling match with an angel. Now, if you go read the account, it says that Jacob wrestled a man, but that's not exactly what's recorded in the ancient Hebrew. It says that Jacob wrestled an Aish. Aish, Aish is the word for male tribal leader or male ruler. It could apply to angels or to humans. The word for human is Adam. That word is not used. But when this wrestling match is going on, Jacob is demanding that this man give him a blessing. At the end it says God gave him a blessing. Another hint to the fact that this man, this male, was actually an angel. From that moment on, Jacob's name changes to Israel. Remember, Jacob means a serper. Israel means one who contends with God, one who fights against God. Later, the nation that comes from him through his children will be called Israel as well, the nation that fights against God. The next two brothers that I'm going to talk about are the sons of Judah. Now, if you remember, Judah is the tribe from which all rightful rulers of Israel were to come, and that included our King Jesus Christ. Now what makes this story especially interesting is the fact that Judah's two sons were also, in a way, his two grandsons. If you want to find out more about that, you're going to have to read it for yourself because time simply will not allow me to go into all the details, but I promise you that the details are quite interesting. Now as the children are being born, the woman who was there assisting in the delivery had the could good sense to mark the children so that the rightful heir, the older, would not be confused with the younger. As the children came out, she tied a piece of string onto the first one, but immediately after doing so, the child that was coming after that child grabbed him and pulled him back in, went around and came out before him. So once again, even though they took all possible precautions, it was the younger that usurped the older in order to take possession of the inheritance. So now that we're aware of the fact that there are so many stories in the Bible about younger brothers usurping the authority of the older brother, how can we apply this information to the spirit realm? How does this information about these two brothers apply to Satan and Jesus? Well, if we can acknowledge the fact that both are created beings and that both were created by the same God, and if we remember that Jesus specifically called God his Father, then by simple logic, Satan and Jesus, both being the children or sons of God, would be brothers. 
Now all we have to do is determine which one is the older and which is the younger. According to Paul, Jesus Christ was the firstborn of all creation. That being the case, it was his right to rule, which he will soon take possession of. He will soon take possession of the inheritance. However, in the interim, Satan has usurped his authority and taken control of the earth for the last 6,000 years. And in fact, the reason that we are having so many problems on this planet currently is because Satan took possession took the inheritance when it was not his right to do so. It really shouldn't surprise us to find out that the stories in the Bible, just like the stories told by every other religion earthwide, are based on this concept of dualism. After all, every religion that exists is based on actual events that took place in the war between God's kingdom and Satan's empire. The only real difference between the Bible and all of those other religions is the fact that the Bible records events from the perspective of the God of creation, while all other religions record events according to the perspective of the God of civilization. Knowing that this war is very real and that there are two very clearly defined sides in this war, and also knowing that we are being given an opportunity to choose which side we're going to be on, it would be wise to consider our choice carefully. Fortunately, we have the Bible, which gives us examples of those who chose to be on God's side as well as those who chose to fight against God. Remember, the word Israel means those who fight against God. When the Israelites were brought out of Egypt, they were given an opportunity to return to natural law just like their original parents and they refused. When they did, God gave them unnatural covenant law. The Israelites were told that God would be their king, but they rejected God and demanded a human ruler. So God gave them a human ruler. And according to the law that they accepted, they were to make sacrifices at the tent of meeting and they were never to use cut stones in their altar. The Israelites chose instead to make their sacrifices in a temple made of cut stones. There are those who would argue that if you are on God's side in this war, if you wish to truly please God, then you must return to the religion that the Jews practiced thousands of years ago. And as evidence, they'll point to the fact that even though the Jews were carted off into Babylonian captivity, God eventually had them released to return to their homeland and return to their religious rituals. However, if you choose to take such a stand, then you need to be aware of the fact that there are literally hundreds of verses that are going to be quite problematic if you should ever attempt to defend your belief. The, we're going to talk about two. The first one we're going to talk about is found at Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1, and most English translations of the Bible say something like this. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord with Satan at his right hand to accuse him. Now this is one of those verses where I'm not asking you to, and I don't ask you to, to just believe everything I say ever, but in this particular instance, I think uh, just to, as a benefit to your faith, it would be very good for you to get your concordance, go online, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and simply look up this verse and see for yourself that what I'm telling you is the truth. <clears throat> and we're going to go over each word. The first word we're going to talk about is Joshua. Joshua in the Old Testament is in Hebrew. It's, it's translated from the word Yeshua. And many of you may already be aware of that. It's, uh, it's the same as the word Greek word, eosaus, which is what we translate into Jesus. And so a lot of people recognize the fact that the word Joshua in the Old Testament is the same word as Jesus in the New Testament. That's not quite true, but it's close enough. 
In any case, there really was a man named Joshua who was a high priest that left Babylon to go back to the promised land to act as high priest after the Jews were released from captivity. But this is very obviously uh, also a prophecy. Now the next thing that we're going to talk about is the word Satan. Satan means resistor. And if you look at this, it actually says Satan, Satan. So uh, instead of saying Satan, the accuser, or Satan was at his right hand to accuse him, you could say Satan would be there to resist him because Satan means resistor. It would not be wrong to say the Satans of the Satans was at Joshua's right hand, Jesus' right hand. But it would also not be wrong to say the resistor of the resistors was at Joshua's right hand, or it would not be wrong to say Satan, the resistor, was at Joshua's right hand, or Jesus' right hand. And the next thing we're going to talk about is the angel of the Lord. What it actually says is the angel of Eowah, or Yahweh, or Jehovah. Now, this makes us believe in English, the English version, that the angel of Jehovah was in the temple, and Joshua was going in with Satan at his right hand to do his rituals. That doesn't actually, it doesn't actually say that or even mean that there. What it means is that when Joshua went into the temple, he would be going in with Satan in a position of authority to perform rituals. The angel of the Lord was not in the temple. The angel of the Lord was simply observing from his position in wherever. So <clears throat> what we really have going on here is Joshua the high priest with Satan at his right hand. And the right hand, that's another word we should have talked about. The right hand is always a position of authority. Joshua performing rituals with Satan at, in a position of authority. And the whole time that this is going on, the angel of the Lord is observing. The next verse that we're going to talk about is found at John chapter 3 and verse 14, where it says that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Now, the, the churches have done a really good job of concealing what this verse is about because they talk about it all the time. And what they say never makes any sense, and yet people listening to the, these teachings buy into it. I don't know why. Every time I ever heard this, I walked away confused until I looked into a concordance. So this is another verse that you really ought to look up, John chapter 3 and verse 14. What it actually says there is just as the serpent was elevated to a high position of authority so the son of man must be lifted up to a high position of authority and you can check this out for yourself because even though the concordance says it means lifted up there are quite a few places in the bible that use this greek word and in each and every one of them it's talking about raising a king in rank bringing someone up into a position of authority like an inauguration or a coronation or an increase in rank of a military officer the word that is used cannot mean lifted up from a low position to a high position in the physical world. It's simply the word cannot be used for that. So if you look at this verse, what it actually says is just as Moses lifted up the serpent to a high position of authority, so the Son of Man must be lifted up to a high position of authority. Who is the serpent? Well, in the book of Revelation, it very clearly says that the serpent is Satan. So it would not be wrong to say that that verse should be translated as just as Moses lifted Satan up to a position of high authority, so the Son of Man must be lifted up to a position of high authority. When I was looking this verse up, I noticed that quite a few Bibles actually say that just as Moses lifted the snake up on a pole... So the Son of Man must be lifted up on a pole. And there is absolutely no reference to any pole in, uh, in the original languages. However, if we take the verse in context, what act is it that gave Jesus his position of authority? Well, it was his willingness to give his life, which required that he be nailed to a pole and stood up just like Moses nailed that or attach that metal snake to that metal pole and lifted it up. So there is an association, but it's nothing at all like what the churches are presenting. 
Now that you have this information <clears throat> and you understand that the Bible is about dualism, it's about the difference between right and wrong, the diff difference between good and evil, the difference between darkness and light, you have to decide which side you want to be on. But you cannot be on the side of right by participating in religion. Now, I know for a fact, that, you know, we can't deny that a lot of people hate the Jews, and they're going to probably listen to this information and use it as an excuse for bad-mouthing the Jews. This verse is not about the Jews. It's about religion. Now, obviously, the religion that happens to be taking the highest position in Satan's systems of religion is the Jews, but the reality is that's not what this verse is about. In the very near future, religion is going to be elevated. The king of religion, the ruler of civilization, is going to take his throne. And when he does it, it's going to be in a very beneficial way for those who worship him. Just keep that in mind as you're trying to decide what you're going to do. And as always, if you don't want to survive, don't listen to me.